Right. Good evening, everyone. This is Andras Barnett, live from Brussels on behalf of Online EU Training. And I'd like to welcome you to our EPSO assistant exam webcast. And before anything else, I just got a confirmation that you are supposed to hear me very well. So I will proceed as planned. Uh, what we're going to do is cover everything that needs to be known about the AST3 exams. And actually, we have two uh, exams running in parallel, something we will look at more in depth, more in detail. This webcast is going to last one hour, and I will do my very best for efficient time management. And uh, after the one hour, uh, we will send you, not immediately, but within a few days, we will send you a recording and a background uh, memo of the event. At the same time, if you are watching this on uh, live streams website, you can log in with a Facebook account if you have one. And you can chat there with other candidates, discuss any issues. And if there is any question, uh, my colleague Martin, he will be uh, watching that and trying to answer anything. And if it's not possible right away, he, uh, he will flag it to me and we will address it after the event. Now, today, um, we are also going to cover a few questions that we have uh, received earlier. You may have seen uh, in the email reminders the little survey or little uh, questionnaire that we asked. So we, we do have a few questions uh, from some of you that I will also cover tonight. And as mentioned earlier, you uh, received the full recording of tonight's presentation. Also, uh, this hopefully very visual uh, so-called Prezi presentation, which uh, should also help in understanding this relatively complex procedure and a Q&A member, uh, as mentioned earlier, with which will address all your questions as before or during this event. Now, let me first of all welcome you to our community of which you are very valued and important members. And this community now uh, boasts uh, 65,000 registered users. So you are part of a large community of, uh, of those who are preparing for exams. And we're proud to say that several hundred EU officials uh, have prepared with our services. Uh, we have 25,000 fans on, on Facebook that I encourage you to join if you have not yet done so already, because a lot of information and sometimes some funny uh, things are, are shared there, both by us and uh, fellow candidates. And um, I also encourage you to have a look at our test packages, because we have a database, the largest uh, for EPSO preparation in the world, uh, 20,000 questions. Uh, and the candidates have used over 12 million questions on the site and we do offer several webinars where you can prepare for the exams with our methodology and with expert advice. Now let's look at what is today's agenda. Today's agenda will be, the, I'll say very briefly a few words about the so-called one day in the life of an assistant. So what exactly does a so-called senior assistant uh, do in his or her daily job. After one looking at the different positions that are available that have just been announced by EPSO, the European Personal Selection Office, move on to see whether you are eligible, which is a crucial fundamental question to make sure that you have the right formal qualifications and that you pass the necessary exams and the tests in order to prove that you're not just formally eligible, but you personally have the capacity, the skills uh, to meet the requirements to be recruited as an EU, as a permanent EU official. Now, a few words on why this is a great opportunity, and I don't want to uh, preach to the converted, because uh, many of you or most of you surely know many of the benefits that EU officials enjoy. However, it's good to have a quick look at it, what perks and what advantages go with the fact that you are a permanent EU once you pass the, the selection tests. Now, this is the number one question of how to get the job. I would say uh, quite some, uh, several pieces of advice on, on what exactly needs to be 
done in terms of methodology. Next. And then we will have a quick look at the assessment center, which is an integral part, the, the main second or the, the second stage of the selection procedure and what needs to be, what sort of exams need to be passed in the assessment center as such. And then a few uh, words on how to prepare for these exams, because based on the several years of experience we have we have had and we have seen uh, from various candidates, and especially those who are who have passed and who were successful in passing these tests and now working full time at one of the EU institutions, we do have a certain uh, certain set or certain list of best practices and, and advice that we, we would like to share with you because if it had worked for several hundred applicants, it certainly will work for you as well. Moving on, in the, as the very last uh, element of today's presentation, we will give you a very special exclusive offer. And one thing I'd already like to flag that it's uh, it's linked to uh, the end of the world doomsday because we only have one day left. So you might ask, why am I then discussing the whole idea of uh, exams? Well, that might be according to a different calendar than the one used uh, for the EPSO exams. So despite these, these predictions, uh, we hope everything will go on as planned, but in any case, our special exclusive offer will be valid and linked to this, uh, I would say, funny prediction of a, a doomsday in 24 hours. So before anything else, let's get started with the one day in the life of an assistant. So what exactly does an assistant do and what will you do once you pass the selection exams, the selection tests, to make sure uh, that you're aware of what awaits you in one of the EU institutions where you could be recruited to. Uh, the first and most important question, and we get this a lot because there is some misunderstanding among candidates, where exactly the place of work is. And the place of work is essentially, for the vast majority of the posts, it is in Brussels with a smaller percentage, roughly 10 to 15 percent of EU positions are based in Luxembourg and a very tiny, tiny number of posts are located in Strasbourg. But this uh, is not more than a few dozens. So you are more likely than anything else to work in Brussels when you are recruited as an ASD3 assistant. Though, if you are applying for the scientists, for the scientific uh, exams, which is linked to the Joint Research Center, which is located in several places around Europe, in that case, then you have a fair chance of working uh, either in Sevilla, in Spain, or you could be working in Karlsruhe, or you could be working in Ispra in Italy, or at different locations. The question is, uh, which institutions could you be working for? I mentioned earlier for the scientific uh, exams, there is the Joint Research Center, which is part of the European Commission and part of the European Commission's scientific uh, background and, and research and policy analysis and scientific analysis arm. And at the same time, for the assistant three, for the uh, other profiles, you could be working at any of the EU institutions, meaning the European Commission, European Parliament, Court of Justice, Committee of the Regions, uh, European Court of Auditors, Council of Ministers, or the European Economic and Social Committee. So EPSO, as the European Personal Selection Office, they do uh, conduct selection procedures for all of these institutions. Now, whether where you are actually recruited to, that's a different matter because that uh, depends on the vacancies and the needs of the different EU institutions and bodies at the moment of recruitment. Moving on, uh, one very important thing, as I mentioned, is that this is not predetermined at the time 
of your application. So now when you apply, you will not know exactly which EU institution you are actually going to be uh, working at after you are placed on the result. So let's look at what positions have been announced uh, just now, which are the exams that are going in parallel and the ones that you can actually apply for. Now, essentially, we have two main groups. We can talk about the scientist type of exams or scientific uh, technicians, if I need to label it, which you see on the left side in blue, or the what we call the senior assistants. So it's not entry level assistants, but senior assistants, uh, also AST3, which have three sub profiles, uh, as you see on the right side of the picture. So let's look at the, the scientific exams where uh, the selection procedure uh, aims at the Joint Research Center. So if you have a background in natural sciences or nuclear research or engineering, then this is the path that you are certainly eligible for and the one that I do encourage you to apply for. And for this uh, branch, you have essentially six sub profiles. So the one you see on the left, it's, it's essentially grouped around natural sciences and nuclear research, a total of 46 places available at the end of the selection procedure. And then you have the engineering type of uh, positions, which have two sub profiles and a total of 32 places. So if your background, your, your qualification, and I'm not talking about university level, I'm talking about either secondary education or, or secondary education plus relevant work experience. So if your background is in the natural sciences or engineering, then this uh, path is made for you. So I do encourage you to apply for that who have a background in audit or finance and accounting or economics or statistics, then the other branch or the other uh, exams are for you. So as you see on the picture for the audit, you have 25 places. Uh, for finance, accounting, you have 45. Economic statistics, you have 40 places available. And in terms of chances, well, the idea is that since uh, these are relatively uh, specific and special profiles, uh, the chances on the face of it would be quite equal. So if you can choose based on your background qualifications between audit and finance accounting, in that case, I would recommend you choose the one uh, where more places are, which is not always the case. Uh, because the more specific your background, the higher the chances. But since these three are comparably specific, uh, the obvious choice is the one where more places are available. One very important thing to bear in mind, if you are eligible for both this one and the scientific branch, you can apply for both. So there is no option uh, on that. You can apply for both the scientific and the senior assistant one, but you must choose only one sub profile. So if you go for nuclear research, you cannot go for engineering. Or if you go for audit, you cannot go for economics statistics. This supposes you have the formal qualifications that make you eligible for these profiles. So Let's look at what, what, what the typical tasks of an AST3 uh, assistant, uh, assistant are. Well, we look at a typical, a typical day for an AST3. And as I said earlier, this is, this is labeled as a, as a senior assistant. So the word assistant should not mislead you because uh, AST3s, they do a substantial, substantial work in basically any directorate general of the commission or any other EU institution. This is not a clerical task. It's not a secretarial task. There is a lot of substance in what you need to do. So for instance, uh, an AST3 could be organizing a, a project team meeting where you revise a bilateral trade chart, you prepare on-site visits, 
where you check uh, the, the status of a, of a given file or an EU initiative with other directorates uh, general. So you need to look at the essence of a, of a given file. Uh, and then you may have a unit meeting with a, where you present a brief report on the state of play of the negotiations, uh, etc. Moving forward, the next up are the language rules. Now, language rules are the source of a lot of confusion and a lot of misunderstanding and occasionally, as a result, a lot of frustration. So, it's important to clarify what the, the term first language means or the term second language actually means in practice. And you may have heard that the Court of Justice has just passed a judgment on rules which called into question the use of English, French, and German as second language. Uh, nevertheless, EPSO has upheld the use of these three languages because these are the uh, most common ones. If candidates are allowed to choose any language, then 90% would choose English, French, and German based on uh, empirical evidence, based on previous experience uh, and statistics that they have conducted. And the language rules and this previously mentioned judgment, that was the reason why the announcement of the current exams was actually postponed. Hence, we also postponed our webcast. So as a result, uh, they had to bring into line certain legal uh, issues. But the substance, the essence, has not changed. So the first language uh, is defined as a language of which you have a thorough knowledge. Now, this, in, in, in everyday terms, it means you have mother tongue level in that language. But the reason why they do not use the term mother tongue is because you may be an EU citizen, yet you may have a different mother tongue, which is not an EU official language, say that could be Russian or that could be uh, Arabic or that could be any other. So the first language is a thorough knowledge of one of the EU's 23 official languages. The second language that you need to choose for the exams, as I mentioned earlier, is English, French, or German. And a footnote here for, for those of you who are native English, French, or German speakers, even those who have one of these as their first language, you need to choose a second language from these three, and it needs to be different from the first language. Another footnote or another uh, thing to mention here, if you are such a polyglot that you speak several languages on extremely high level and you're confident in all these languages, you may choose as a first language uh, basically any of the languages that you speak in and write in very fluently and the second language equally. So the, the bottom line is that languages are not linked to your citizenship. And this is based on equality of chances, non-discrimination principles. But the bottom line is that the language is a free choice and it is determined by your level of knowledge. So let's look at uh, the citizenship rules, which is very straightforward. Uh, you need to, be, need to have a citizenship of one of the uh, EU's 27 member states not 28, so Croatians, uh, Croatian citizens cannot apply for these exams uh, because for Croatian citizens, there are currently many ongoing exams uh, happening tailored specifically uh, for them uh, as Croatian citizens or Croatian speakers. So for these two AST3 exams, the branches, you need to have one of the EU's 27 citizenship. So let's look at, uh, in a little bit more detail, uh, at, the, at the type of positions that are available that I mentioned earlier. For the scientific uh, branch or the scientific exams, you see that uh, there are branches on biology, life and health sciences, chemistry, physics and material science, nuclear research, civil and mechanical engineering, electrical engineering and electronics. So if you have a natural sciences background, as said earlier, this is certainly 
your time to apply. And is something I would really like to highlight, not just for the scientists, but also for the, the senior assistant AST3, uh, the other three profiles. Something I really would like to emphasize that you may have heard of a judgment called the Pactitis judgment, uh, which was, I won't go into any detail, a legal challenge uh, against certain procedural arrangements of EPSO, which resulted in, in, in cancelling and annulling the, the results of or the, uh, the 2010 uh, selection procedure. Now, those who passed that in that selection procedure, they have their secure place. But those who did not pass, the exam in 2013 will be repeated. And this results in, in, it has the consequence that those who did not participate in 2010 in those exams are not going to be allowed to apply for the administrator, for the generalist administrator exams in March. Why am I saying this here? Because even though this is not an administrator exam, but an AST3 exam, I do encourage everyone who, who is eligible to apply for this now, because next year you will have much more limited uh, possibilities to enter the EU institutions and to become a permanent official. So if you have the, the, the right qualifications as an auditor, as a finance accounting uh, expert, as an economics or, or statistics uh, policy officer, do apply now. The number on the screen, uh, which I mentioned earlier, so this is a, a recap of the opportunities uh, that have opened up uh, today. So uh, application deadline, 22nd of January. So unless uh, you, you, you're, you totally turn off your mind during the uh, Christmas holiday and the New Year partying, uh, make sure that you, you don't forget to apply in time and please do not leave this for the last moment because servers may crash, EPSO may have some technical difficulties, you do not want to miss the deadline for application. So make sure that by the 22nd of January, you will have filled in all the forms and it may take half an hour or to one hour to fill in all the necessary forms online. So leave sufficient time for that and make sure you validate your application. And then within uh, 72 hours, you should get a confirmation from EPSO that your application has been registered. Look at the, the different steps of the exam and uh, different steps of the selection procedure, which as you uh, see on the screen has essentially five parts or five major steps. And I will look at each of them one by one, which are represented by these five circles. So let's zoom in. In terms of uh, eligibility, question is, are you eligible? And this is something which is fundamental because you do not want to spend time with preparing and with your fingers crossed and being nervous about sitting these competitions uh, unless you are absolutely sure that you are eligible for a given post. So make sure that you you check the qualification that you have and the work experience, if any, the work experience you have, that it fully matches the eligibility criteria. And this criteria is also published, obviously, uh, on EPSO's website in the application form. And the, the, the most authentic source of information, or to be uh, exactly exactly precise, the authentic source of information is the official journal where the notice of competition has been published. So make sure that you have this uh, properly set out. So to give you a quick and my legal disclaimer is that what I'm saying here is I'm trying to be as precise as a lawyer could be, but make sure that the authentic information is the one you find in the official journal. So for the scientific uh, profile, 
you need to have a secondary school uh, uh, degree uh, followed by six years of relevant experience and then you will be eligible for the post or you can have a relevant post-secondary education and three years of relevant experience so you see the difference whether in the first case your secondary school is an is an ordinary secondary school degree but you have sufficient relevant work experience in the case of the senior assistants uh, the the principles are exactly the same so a secondary school degree and six years of relevant experience in audit or economics or statistics or you have a relevant post-secondary education and three years of relevant experience now here I'd like to take uh, a short short uh, moment to address some common questions common concerns common questions uh, also some of these were were asked uh, in our in our pre uh, webcast survey so I'd like to address first and foremost whether overqualification be a problem and the answer is no it cannot be a problem in any way under qualification of course because that affects the eligibility but whether you are a PhD or whether you have more work experience than what is required this has absolutely no negative consequences on your application obviously to be fair this is a choice that you make whether with uh, an enormous amount of years of, of work experience is this the career path that you'd like to pursue I do encourage you to do that but it's up to you to decide whether this is the right thing but in formal terms overqualification is certainly not a problem which diplomas are accepted and this is an, an evergreen question and I'm sorry but I will not be able to give you a hundred percent comprehensive answer for that because there are so many diplomas and even when it comes to post-secondary education there's such a large variety of uh, of, of uh, qualifications that um, that this occasionally is the is the decision of the selection board so, uh, just for those who, who are not familiar with the term selection board selection board in in formal terms it's not EPSO the selection board it's composed of EU officials uh, a small group of EU officials who are ultimately responsible for a specific competition and they act independently from EPSO obviously based on guidelines and best practices and and strictly uh, legislated terms but they're independent from EPSO and when it comes to accepting a certain qualification for the given exam it is the selection board's assessment evaluation uh, judgment if you may to decide whether whether they accept your qualification but the rule of thumb is that it needs to be relevant so as long as you can prove uh, and demonstrate based on the subjects that you had based on uh, uh, other pieces of information whether it's relevant to the profile then you should be safe and the last question is which which i i, I hear very very often uh, in brussels can an assistant an ast3 or other become an administrator an ad and this is again a choice whether you you have ambitions to do that it is possible uh, nobody says it's easy there are essentially two ways to do that one of them is that you can pass an administrator an AD competition an open competition just like any other EU citizen and then once you pass it you have a chance to become an administrator the other path is that occasionally or actually I think it's organized every year you may enter a certain program called uh, called a certification procedure which is internally in the EU institutions organized for for assistants who would like to become ADs so that means a series of courses a series of exams at the end of which you become uh, eligible to to be sort of converted into a 
So let's look at why this is a great opportunity. And as I said, I'll spend just a few few moments on this because many of you are well familiar with this. Uh, nevertheless, uh, one major attraction, needless to say, that the salaries are highly attractive. For AST3 level, roughly the net salary is around 3,200 euros. This is, uh, there's a, there, there are a lot of factors which affect the salary because you have several benefits, uh, whether you are married, whether uh, you get a very generous health insurance, uh, if you have children, uh, there is also a child allowance and, and other, other benefits. And there are European schools which are free uh, for EU officials, uh, for their children, to, uh, to study their tongue. And, uh, well, I'm correcting myself, to study in their first language. Uh, obviously, they have a possibility to learn foreign languages and uh, get a high quality education. So salary, uh, the base salary is roughly 3200 and there are additional benefits and sometimes even additional uh, amounts on top. This was the, the first part in terms of eligibility and, and the overall uh, framework. So let's look at actually the exams that you need to pass, the so-called pre-selection exams. Now, what I'm going to present here, uh, and these the main boxes you see, it's, it's uh, essentially uh, refers to the AST3 for the senior assistants, not uh, for the scientific branch, for the scientific exams, because their pre-selection, as we will see, is a so-called talent screener. And I'll mention that briefly, what that is. So the selection for the, for the AST3 is the, the, the relatively classic tests that EPSO uses in its selection procedures uh, for most exams. So there is an abstract reasoning test, which is done in your first language, though uh, if you look at this image, language really doesn't play any role in this, apart from the classic question, which image is the next in the row or the next in the series? This, uh, you have 10 questions and you will have 10 minutes. So it's a pretty tough thing to uh, find the one that's next in the series uh, in, in basically one minute per question. And the trick is you need to identify patterns and you need to identify uh, the shapes which move according to a certain logic, which turn and twist. And then you can by yourself decide what should be in the next image actually find the matching answer uh, for for this one if i'm not mistaken it's uh, e is the correct answer so the second exam or the second test you need to sit is the numerical reasoning this is again in the first language uh, which we saw is one of the eu's official languages you have a chart uh, a table with data seemingly complex but not necessarily so always make sure to pay attention to the heading what it actually contains uh, the units the measurements because sometimes uh, the measurement is in tons sometimes it's in kilogram and the question may have a different unit of measurement so make sure that you don't uh, choose uh, pick the wrong answer because you missed the unit of measurement uh, numerical reasoning has 10 questions and you need to answer it in 20 minutes so you have two minutes per question and uh, the logic is always you need to identify the elements of the table that you need to focus on because it could happen that 90 percent of the table is not important is irrelevant for the sake of answering the question so however complex it may seem you only need to focus two or three uh, pieces of data and nothing else for the numerical reasoning, the, the, the path to get to the right is really that you interpret the data, which data you need. You need to conduct, you need to perform the, the proper reasoning. So how do I get to the result? Which, which operations do I need to do? You, need, you do an, a, a guesstimation or estimation uh, because the less you need to calculate, the better. By the way, you do get a calculator an on screen and even a physical calculator, but it takes time to use that. And eventually you do a calculation and try to pick the right answer from the four 
answer options. Verbal reasoning in the first language, again, and this is where language is so important, and that is exactly the reason why we at Online EU Training are offering uh, verbal reasoning tests in 11 languages. And as far as I know, we are the only ones uh, to do that in major languages, and we are considering adding more in the near future. So verbal reasoning is where you have 20 questions you need to answer in 35 minutes. So you always has, have a, a text passage and a question which refers to which of the following four statements is actually correct. And there's always only one correct answer. And here I'd like to add that in all of these tests, wrong answers are not penalized. You do not get any deduction or any penalty for, for putting the wrong answer. So if you don't know, make a guess. And certain things to keep in mind answering verbal reasoning questions is be careful because outside information, uh, information, uh, data that, that you know by yourself from reading the news, from talking to colleagues, that piece of information is not relevant for the sake of the exercise, so that should not confuse you or mislead you. Generalizations in the statement when it says, every EU member state is uh, keen on uh, increasing the pension age. I mean, when somebody says every member state, that's a generalization. So make sure that you look at what is a, a specific enough or too broad of a, of a possibility. And then again, possibility versus fact in the state, what is given as a, as a, as a established information, established uh, thing, or what is a possibility when they include the word may or possibly or could. So all these prepositions and in all the other languages, uh, different declinations of the word, make sure that you pay rigorous attention, rigorous attention, because this can lead you to picking the wrong answer. And then there is a last one where similar wording could mislead you in a verb statement where two statements have very uh, close uh, wording and that may mislead you because you are under stress and you may not pay such a close attention to how that sentence is formulated. I'm uh, pausing here for one second because uh, I get a message that you may not hear me. So I'm trying to get confirmation whether it has come back. So I'm waiting for that confirmation. Confirmation, please, Martin, if you could let me know whether we have everything as it should be. So I'm waiting for communication and sorry for this uh, issue, trying to resolve that as soon as possible. Oh. I see that there may be some technical issue here. Okay, let me restart the broadcast. It says perfect streaming. So um, I'm wondering what could be wrong. Uh, we are still looking at it. Looking at it because on my side, internet is working as it should. Trying to wait uh, for confirmation that everything is all right. Also on the viewer end. And I'm waiting for Martin to see. But in any case, I will continue because in worst case, if you may not hear me right now, you will hear this as part of the thing. So I would uh, rather go on and have it uh, sent to you in the end. So moving forward, regarding the tests that you that you uh, that you need to need to uh, see. Uh, there is the accuracy and precision test. So accuracy and precision, which is uh, it's, uh, 
a very special kind of test. Uh, it has 40 questions that you need to answer in six minutes. In only six minutes, you need to answer that uh, because it's a very quick exercise. It's something you can do very fast, uh, meaning that you, here's a table and you need to identify which rows match the one below and which rows are actually uh, where there's a mistake. So it's a spot the mistake type of exercise uh, that, you, that you need to do. And that's why there's such a short time for it because uh, it's very fast to do one uh, and uh, very, very relatively easy to answer one question. So uh, I'm just also checking the technical side of it. And let me restart the system to make sure that you can follow the presentation. So one second here. I'll restart.